uh, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't spend this kind of time with these people. I mean, it's not like they're all that interesting. And, uh, and you, might think that, <laughs> you might think that I actually knew them with all this hugging and embracing and kissing on stage, uh, but you might be mistaken there, too. Uh, I want to welcome uh, all of you uh, to the third installment of the American Race Crisis series. Uh, it has been a truly a joy and a pleasure to work with uh, such a wonderful team of new school uh, students, recent graduates, archivists, programmers, techies, uh, just really terrific production. Um, also, I want to encourage all of you, if you've not seen the exhibition, uh, that uh, tells the story of how this series came to be in 1964, uh, provides all of the transcripts of the 15 lectures, uh, and provides some um, context uh, for why the New School felt it was so important to have this conversation, which of course contributes to the reason for us being here this evening. Um, I want to just mention um, a couple of people by name in particular, Miles Corman. Uh-oh, tech. I thought I was amplified, I'm sorry. Can you hear me, testing, testing? Is my mouth too far away from it? Is that better? Yes. OK. Thank you for the feedback. It's New York. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? It's New York. <laughs> Miles Corman. I um, want to just uh, particularly thank Miles Corman, wherever he is, uh, for the work that he's done to make this possible. Dominique House, also, who worked very closely with him. I want to also thank uh, the Schomburg staff uh, for their contributions to Clarice, Rosette Sharif, and Lady Sasha Jones. And finally, to Dean Browner, who introduced us all, and to President Van Zandt, uh, who helped to support uh, this, uh, this massive undertaking. To our guests this evening, uh, to Mr. Belafonte, to Raquel Cepeda, and to Philip Agnew, thank you for joining us. So I don't want to get in the way, but I do want to set the context for it tonight. And I want to bring into the conversation right away one of the lecturers, John Killens, John Oliver Killens, uh, who is best known as a black arts movement writer. Uh, this is his image. Uh, he helped to found the Harlem Writers Guild uh, and wrote uh, nearly a, do a dozen novels uh, from the 1950s uh, through the 1980s. Uh, some have described him as both a contemporary and an inspiration to August Wilson. But given the relationship of art to activism, I felt having a writer sort of set the stage for our conversation uh, would both help us to, uh, to think about the contributions that Mr. Belafonte have made and also to sort of help him or to give him a way to help us understand the context of 64 and Killens' voice and, and who he was in conversation with at that time. And we're going to take it from there. So, First quote, I'm going to read it along in case it's too small for those to see or for those in our live stream audience. I believe that we must fight this year as if the struggle was going out of style. History is with the Negro, but time is fickle minded and it is on the side of him who makes the most of it. The tide of freedom is sweeping across the whole world from Mississippi to Johannesburg and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. The important question that faces the country is not what are we going to do about our downtrodden colored people. The question is, can we awake our country and bring her into the middle of the 20th century when more men are free than ever before, since the beginning of time, since man left the cave? This is the most important thing about this century, not who makes the biggest bomb or who reaches the moon first or who has the most <coughs> split-level Cadillacs to mix up a metaphor. This is the century when color prejudice and color privilege will be outmoded. This is the freedom century. And so my question to Mr. Belafonte to start us off, was it in fact the freedom century? Was that the goal? And how was freedom understood in that context, and was it a limited or expansive vision? Or anything you think about what <laughs> Brother Keller had to say?
freedom was best defined by its absence. It was something we didn't have, something we didn't fully embrace because the environment in which we came into uh, did not stimulate the idea that freedom uh, belonged to all of us, did not stimulate the idea that uh, those of us who were second-class citizens didn't deserve that, uh, that space. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? It's the new school with better? old technology. No, I'm joking. I could resist. So I'll just hold my mic while I speak. Hey, man, how you doing? Quite well. <laughs> OK. There you go. Thank you. Uh, when you talk about John Oliver Killens, uh, as eloquent an artist as he was, and as uh, and the depth of his gift, it was also to be exercised in the midst of a of, of a time mm -hmm. when you had Langston Hughes, you had James Baldwin, you had uh, uh, so uh, you had through, because it was through John that I met Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois, mm. and when you had that circle of power, of intellectual power, in your midst, the harvest was enormous mm. because of how they thought and what they thought and the obstacles that had to be overcome. Uh, we could only allude concept of freedom because none of us had ever fully felt its, its, its presence. Uh, but that's true about most people in America of color. Uh, uh, this country was conceived in the idea of freedom for some, oppression for others, most of the others. And uh, when you're living in a place where there's that double standard, some of these freedom is such an abstract, what is it? Democracy is such an abstract, what is it really? The fact that we are experimenting, we're trying to find out how to mold these things into some service for our social need, it's virtuous, but in its application, in its practical, in its practical application, uh, I look at the New School of Social Research. What I like about it is that it's an institution that insists on radical thinking. And I came here in 1945 to be a student of this institution. That's all that was around. Not so much the the hard sciences or the or the or the, or the technique of learning. It was the content of learning that uh, played itself out. And in that context, we were constantly searching for what's, it, what's democracy, what's freedom, what's, what is the absence of oppression like? So that when John Killings stepped into the space, beyond his writing, uh, the first time I knew of him, or the first work that I knew of his, was a book called Young Blood, mm -hmm. and it was it was the book of the of, of the period. Published in fifty four, right? Nineteen fifty four, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I knew him before that when he when we formed all of these little community organizations to get us into the world of of uh, opportunity, the American Negro Theater at the basement of the Schomburg, which you which you serve. This thing about freedom has been a constant, something we've all, that we've been pursuing all the life I've known. And it seems to me that everybody in the life before me seems to have been pursuing <laughs> the same thing. And it has eluded all of us. There's an idea about what it's like, but it's never been tested to its full measure. So the, most of the time, what you see when you look at freedom, you're looking at the privilege of the elite privilege of the ruling class, privilege of people who have the tools with which to manipulate freedom to their, to their uh, goals and interests. Having said that, I defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> so
So, I guess, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> really? I'm so loud. Yeah. Now you can hear me, okay. So, uh, before we even continue, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this is the second anniversary of the death, the murder of Trayvon Martin. And speaking about reincarnation, we're going to see this happen again and again. Trayvon Martin is our generation's Emmett Till. Now it's Jordan Davis. It'll be hundreds of more people until we coalesce as a people. Coalesce meaning, you know, 50 years ago, we're looking at race, and still today, and identity and social justice through a binary black and white lens. When, it, when we're living in shades of gray, and we were talking about this before, and one thing that I took away from the first conversation you had with Reverend uh, C.T. Vivian, that really stayed with me all these days, is something that he said about an identity crisis, something that I see hasn't been resolved, but exacerbated and subdued every February and every few days in September, few days in October when we celebrate, you know, whatever Latino Hispanic History Month means. I, don't, I still have no clue and I'm Dominican. So um, one thing he said was the identity crisis, which was ultimately necessary for everything else we did, is that, they, uh, is that they had set the stage for our liking ourselves. Because remember, if, we, if there hadn't been some people who liked being black, we would never have come to a point where we were willing to fight for being black. Mm. See, that really stayed with me because, I mean, we talk about you know, uh, cultural movements and political activism and the hip hop generation, generations either being apathetic or being you know, uh, progressive. That doesn't matter until we start looking at identity and social justice in a very holistic way. Meaning we have to take, we have to ex exercise our freedom to do the work, the dirty work, the ugly work, the painful work that it is of getting to know ourselves and getting to know each other. Because only then will black and Latino people and our allies from other you know, uh, cultures come together and fight for the same thing. Which is why I really am honored and, you know, obviously this is, you know, I'm totally honored and kind of nervous to be sitting to, next to uh, Mr. Harry Belafonte, but I'm really, 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 really inspired by what you're doing with the Dream Defenders because it's one of the only organizations that I've seen that actually have Latino and black Americans coming together. Though we have this impish oak by the name of George Newman who, who has exercised the ultimate uh, um, um, act of self-hatred by killing young, his young brother, mm -hmm. right? I think that it's really amazing what you're doing, what you're looking ahead. You, you know, we're not, when this happened, I feel like Latinos had to really um, kind of make excuses and apologize for what this one guy did. When it's not, it's a lot deeper than that. Mm -hmm. We have to start looking at things in a way, in gray, because that's where we exist. We exist in the gray. It's not black or white anymore. Mm -hmm. It wasn't black or white then. But people, I guess, when they, you know, my parents' generation, when they come, came to this country, they either became white or became black. They chose instead of selectively acculturating and doing the work to, um, you know, to, to get to know themselves and what we had in common mm -hmm. with our black American counterparts mm -hmm. here in the States. So I really commend what you're doing, and it's very inspiring to me being kind of an old hip hop head, to see you. you taking the mantle. Thank you. So can I, uh, can I ask a question that I think is, uh, a, I think a harder question to ask about freedom, and it's one of the reasons why I presented the quote, and that is that there are blacks and Latinos, let's be real, mm -hmm. who do believe that the civil rights movement and the period since 1964 did achieve freedom, and that that freedom is now articulated in the freedom not to be black or Latino any longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I right? think that's, so, that's so, uh, yeah. Because you know, we could imagine that we're all still in this together, but I think part of what makes this moment so uniquely difficult for young people is the pressures to put that kind of racial consciousness behind. Mm -hmm. And so it may not flow from the same space that C.T. Vivian spoke of, mm -hmm. of a space where the degradation of, of blackness was in the material reality of the Jim Crow South or the 
segregated Harlem or Detroit of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but in a world where we have to debate the merits of whether black people are post-black or not, or whether there are 40 million ways of being black. Those um, are all distractions. Race still matters. It's, I'm not saying that it doesn't. I'm saying that for some people, that is the realization of a certain kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's predicated on the end of the sort of <laughs> legal barriers of segregation and the the total experience of white supremacy, which mm -hmm. we can debate what it looks like today for those who suffer from it continuously, but also it has relaxed. I just wanna, I wanna play because I wanna hear what your thoughts are about that issue and whether or not you see that as a part of the problem or is it just inconsequential? Uh, so, and I'm on well, You're on a college campus, so you know what I'm talking about. Right, well, I'm, I'm off, I'm off. I'm on college campuses, but, um, I graduated from a historically black university, um, and uh, it was there that uh, throughout my entire life of going to school, it was at Florida a &M University where I made a number of realizations that being black didn't just mean one thing, and I learned that very quickly when I met Jamaicans and I met uh, folks from the Caribbean. And then I also um, realized as I went there that there were a number of black people that didn't grow up like I did. Um, and so um, we're not a monolithic thing. And so um, I think at where we stand now um, is we cannot ignore race and uh, its implications in every part of the human experience in this country. Um, and the fact that if there's a stratus that black or brown or the closer you get to black, the lower you are on that rung. Um, I do believe that there are a number, I was in a discussion yesterday at the University of Florida, and there are a number of people, and I think they were present 50 years ago, and I think they'll continually be present, that look to tokens and look to assimilation into the power structure as an indication that we have won. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a continual issue. Um, and I, I actually think it will always be an issue until we truly confront white supremacy and call it out at every, every juncture and every amount of privilege, male privilege. Um, if, if I can, if I can touch back on, on freedom, mm -hmm. um, and freedom is very subjective. Uh, when I think of freedom and liberation, I think the ability to be fully whom you were born to be. Um, our world, specifically America, um, from the moment you are born, chisels you into what it wants you to be, right? Um, and that's why, you know, in A Brave New World, that's why we couldn't read that book because it, it brought to the forefront what America truly was. You're, you're supposed to be this. And so the, the anti of that for me is freedom, the freedom from all oppression. And um, when you're looking at young people today, I think we are beginning to realize um, our freedom to be whom we are, um, and then what that means to the collective. And I think that may be a hallmark of our quote unquote movement, is a more of a collective feeling about um, our value system and the America that we want to see. Um, and it won't, I, I would even say it's, a, it's a shades of brown, because our country, our country will look different. And so we've got to reconcile uh, what a world in 20 years is that doesn't look like the world today. We, it will be very hard to look at someone and say, you're from there, or you're this. It will be very hard to do that. And so our movement is trying to reconcile what that world looks like. And so what we've done, what Dream Defenders has done, is said, what is the antithesis of freedom? It is, it is imprisonment. And I think if we're able to look at it in that scope and if we go to that level, we can then say, uh, so imprisonment uh, in this country, mass incarceration, et cetera, affects a certain group of people. And they are black and brown, but they're also most likely poor. And so I think we have an opportunity now as a young person, I'm 28, I'm going to call myself young for about two more years. <laughs> I'm a rock. I'm a rock with it, but uh, but um, I, I I hope I'm answering the question and uh, and also putting something else out there that um, our struggle, though we cannot be uh, though we can't ignore race, we won't be shackled by race and what it means 
We've got to, uh, it, we've got to be, uh, we've got to have a critical analysis of what race means in this country. But we also have to not be afraid to talk about economy. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're gonna truly topple power structures in this country and in, in many others, we've got to talk about economy. And we've got to talk about uh, how race and economy are interlinked um, in this country, how status, race, and economy are linked in this country, and, and try to figure out how to win. Um, and, and, and that's where I will defer. I'll can, I, can I add something to that? I think part of winning is, is through education. And I think because the quote unquote, I hate this term, but mainstream mm -hmm. sees that, mm -hmm. they're trying to ban ethnic studies. Right. They're trying to ban this information that there were people that were brown, that were black, that were part of the building of, of America as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, and you have in Arizona, you have a ban. In Texas, they're trying to ban ethnic studies. Um, and basically, the reasoning is because it breeds a resentment for our forefathers. Right. And it also promotes critical thinking. I'm quoting. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what's happening under, you know, right underneath our noses. Mm -hmm. That creates, that keeps us in this very, in this septic, vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. You have children that go to school and learn that people, it's just very holistic. People that build America, people that are, that are American, that truly belong in society, don't look like them. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, how many times have you watched on, on you know, these great channels, National Geographic, American, the men who build uh, A&E, people who build America are always, you know. Right. White construction work. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But then, and then they become disengaged, and then what happens is you have a high, uh, rate of um, high school and college dropouts, high school dropouts, then that leads into a, this vicious cycle of poverty. You have, for example, Latina American teenagers. Right, one of the fastest growing demographics in the country have the highest suicide rate and suicide ideation rate in the country. They're three times more likely than white Americans to their white counterparts to uh, commit, try to commit suicide or fantasize about it, and twice as likely as black American um, young uh, uh, teenagers to do the same. And this is because they're existing, they're trying to negotiate liminality. Mm -hmm. And this all starts in school, people telling them, you know, you speak English funny, or you're not, you know, th this enough, you don't fit there, you must be illegal, because that's, those are the, all the code words that we hear in the media. Then you have this whole generation of, of, of children that are basically trying to find themselves out in the street, dropping out of school. This is all holistic, not getting to know themselves, and then what happens? We continue with the cycle of poverty. Mm -hmm. And how, do we, how can we achieve this dream now, if we, you know, if we're, if we're stuck we're stuck in this depression and in, in, this, in this space where we're not even, you know, um, um, first of all, there is no, basically, uh, there's a fracture with our generations between the civil rights generation, um, the earlier hip hop generation. Can I hold you on that fracture? Huh? Can I hold you on that fracture? Okay, well, all, all, all this to say is mm -hmm. this lack of, of resources and education is exacerbating um, the depression and the um, disengagement of our young people in schools. Mm -hmm which you know leads to poverty, yeah. right? So we, uh, we have another quote, and I want to use it as the touchstone for a conversation about the challenges today, um, grounding it in the approaches to transformation. Uh, so we're going to pick up where Raquel has uh, taken us. So this quote, we artists must create a new dialogue, and it is left up to us, to the writer, the artist, to create this vision, not the politician, the diplomat, or the statesman. This is more of John Oliver Killens uh, as he spoke at the New School on March 12, 1964. So Mr. Belafonte, what is the role of the artist either then or now and everything in between? The earliest instruction that led me to uh, lust after the world of the arts it was something that Paul Robeson said, and that was that artists are the gatekeepers of truth, mm -hmm. and that art is the radical voice of civilization. Mm -hmm. If those two definitions are brought together, that makes the arts probably the most important uh, environment for me 
in terms of social expression. Um, I think that what we're wrestling with here in these definitions like fry, uh, freedom and race and uh, biracial and postracial and all the that you refer to as distractions uh, don't exist in the abstract. They exist for a reason. They're in our discourse and our dialogue mm -hmm. for a reason. And I think that, you know, Goebbels in the rise of the Third Reich had said, control what people know and you will control what people do. Mm -hmm. And in the context of our experiences, because the young, my young colleagues on this platform will hardly be able to say a thing. I was their age, and that's kind of, and I thought I'd never ever say that. <laughs> it's, it's such a drag, but <laughs> the truth is the matter that I was 18. I was in the United States. I was in the war when I was 17, serving the United States, looking to bring my patriotic fervor to the table and to say, hey, yo, uh, the colored people and the Negroes of this nation are in this struggle for freedom and democracy with the expectation at the end of the struggle, uh, if we are victorious, we will also reap the harvest of a new America, of a new paradigm, of a new moment. Instead of that happening in this quest for freedom, we came back and particularly the black soldier, male or female, were absolutely demonized. Uh, Isaac Woodard, a black soldier coming back from the Pacific, serving gallant, gallantly, came in, mustered out to go back to South Carolina, got on a bus, told he couldn't sit in the front of the bus or any seat he wanted. And he just said, you don't understand, we just got through settling that question. He just defeated Hitler and fascism and the, and the cremation of six million people in the name of your point of view. That's over. So they replied by uh, bringing him off the bus, beating him half to death, and gouging out both of his eyes with the blunt end of a billy club. Made the headlines everywhere. But there were hundreds and hundreds of cases of black soldiers and black servicemen being put upon by that society which wanted to keep niggers in check. You all got very heady with this war stuff. You all got this liberation theme going. It doesn't work here. We had an option to acquiesce to that point of view and get on with business as was traditional, or to find new approaches or find other ways in which to defeat this unaccepted challenge. And that was when the civil rights movement began to get its first contemporary energizing towards a movement. The ruling folks stepped in there. The government created McCarthyism. They created all of these devices and all of these things in the name of democracy, in the name of freedom, that did nothing but oppress those who were already oppressed, seeking to participate in this ritual they said they were preparing for us. My only point with this is that uh, uh, I am, I am, I have run out of approaches to defining who and what and where we are, because to the extent that you say it's distracting, I completely embrace. Uh, we're not talking about what needs to be talked about. We're too busy being uh, trying to define who we are. Well, you know. It ain't just about race. When I was born, I was colored. Not too long after that, I was Negro. Not too long after that, I was black. And the most recent incarnation is, I'm African American. <laughs> I've lived almost a century, okay? And I mean, to be part of a, a life that spends a century just looking for title uh, is a weird trip. Right. So don't ask. Don't ask me about freedom. I got a whole <laughs> bunch of ideas on what freedom must be like, but when I get there, I'll tell you what it is. I just think that uh, when I look at uh, 
Philip of Agnew and what's going on with Dream Defenders when I went down to Florida and uh, I wanted to be a witness because that's what I do. I go to places where things are happening and I don't want to hear it through the editorial page of the New York Times or the Amsterdam News. I want to hear it by seeing it, touching it, smelling it, feeling it, and watching its anguish and watching its joy. And when I went down, what really filled my bosom with a sense of opportunity and delight was to see the Dream Defenders. Philip Agnew was one of the leaders in the front of this group of young people, reminded me so much of SNCC. Because when we came to that moment in our own charge, we didn't have the leaders we thought we needed. We had historical figures that influenced us, but on the day-to-day -day basis, the NAACP, Urban League, all the organizations around had completely ignored the struggle of people in poverty, though they said their institution was created to serve that. But they were so busy whining and dining at the White House and, and uh, having moments uh, uh, of, that uh, they forgot us. When, when we stepped into the breach, it's interesting. Most of that period was led by people you'd never heard of. Dr. King, he stepped in, he was 24. Jesse Jackson, 20. Uh, Julian Bond, 19. John Lewis, 18. Uh, I looked around. Diane Nash, 17 years old, with child. So when you look at these group of young people emerging from their communities, they set the trajectory, they set the plan, they set the target, and they went out and did it. And the rest of the black community and the leadership of the progressive was trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. I see this whole thing from a perspective that is somewhat repetitious, somewhat uh, redundant, and in its redundancy, I think the enemy has used the most clever device. Uh, yes, it is true we don't have signs that say no niggers, or no colored, or no black, or no whatever. And with the absence of that sign, and now we have the official right to vote, all those things that were the harvest of our struggle, now, not only do the people who are the most powerful recipients of that prize ignored it, but nobody has led them to the debate and the discourse as to how could you ignore this? How could you miss it? So when young Philip says that he's interested in getting people to register and vote, that's what we did 50 years ago. We only, not only got people to register and vote, we got people murdered in the process of going to get the right to vote for the Goodwood and Cheney. You know, we had the Emmett Tills of the world that paid the price. It was all there. Now we come back to this window and mirror of, of repetition. So what's new? What do you say to this moment? How do you define the gods? I look at black America, I am absolutely nonplussed that we could be victimized the way we are, two million people in prison, et cetera, et cetera, and all the rest that you know. And <laughs> where are the agitators? Where's the rebellion? Why does the machine still run? Why do we permit the machine to run? Where is the militancy? Where is the valor in struggle? Where is the radical thinking? And I think that America has shut down any idea of pleasure in radical thought. The press doesn't let you think radically. The schools don't let you think radically. The church is definitely out of the radical business. So when you're looking for your moment and your time in history to be nourished, ain't nobody out there giving you the tit. You're not getting fed based upon these things that should be a big part of your diet. They have shut it down. And not only have they shut it down, they're shutting down North Carolina. They're certainly on the way to doing that in Florida. It's in Texas. It's in Arizona. You go along. That, those 13 states that have stop and search and start uh, 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 
uh, uh, uh, you got it. <laughs> and a whole bunch of other titles. Uh, all that stuff, you know, let me ask you something. The fact that black people aren't talking about the Koch brothers makes me, yo, the oppressor has just taken everything over. Unbridled capital and capitalism has suffocated life, all of life. Oh. One last thing I'll leave you alone. So whether it's Latino or not Latino, woman, not woman, we're all in this mess, and we all have a stake in it. And what we got to do is to stop, stop looking at one another for our identity and look to one another for our inspiration. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna run a clip. We're gonna run a clip of Dream Defenders, and then Raquel's gonna respond, and Phil's gonna jump, jump in. So it's a quick clip for anybody in the audience who doesn't know enough about the organization um, to fully appreciate what Harry is referring to in terms of Philip being an agitator. All right. <laughs> Everybody, put three fingers in the air. The sky is falling. The wind is calling. Stand for something or die in the morning. My name is Philip Agnew. I am a dream defender. And this is our 2014 State of the Youth Address. It has been said that you judge a people by how it treats the littlest of these, the least of these, the last. How it treats its incarcerated, its poor, its women and their young. Thus, if we are to truly measure the state of the youth and be honest with ourselves, then the only logical conclusion that can be drawn is that America never loved us. Remember when they sold out our education, when they closed all of our schools and devalued our teachers and robbed us of our history and then gave what was left to the corporations? Remember, because yesterday a child in America wore the wrong uniform to school and left that school in handcuffs. Yesterday in America, an immigrant family was ripped apart. A father was taken from his family. The children were left to the wolves and the mother was left to do double and make half while still living in the shadows. Today, a child hung themselves in a closet instead of coming out of it. Yesterday, we broke ground on yet another Walmart. Every day, low wages. Every day. We shot Renisha and Jonathan on our doorstep. We shot Israel Hernandez on a street in front of an abandoned McDonald's. We shot Ricardo in our backyard, and we shot Jesus Huerta in North Carolina in the backseat of a police car in handcuffs. And we left Kendrick Johnson in a musty gym mat in a gym in Valdosta, Georgia. Yesterday it seemed like all was lost, like our hopes for a true democracy were cast to the darkness and silenced in the sunset. But this morning, as the sun rose over the country, a dream nation awakened from hibernation. Dream nation is getting to work on the America of tomorrow. If you listen closely, you can hear the chorus of an emerging new America. I am not your sidekick. Si se puede. Undocumented and unafraid. He saw about sock. I believe that we will win. We ready. We coming. And this spring, there will be action. It's happening. The revolution is inevitable. For the gutter is full and the sewers are overflowing. And so we're calling on youth from around the country. On the corner and in the classroom, from the church to the trap, every doctor, disciple, domestic servant, and don't. Raquel, you were saying? Well, as the person in the middle of these two, because I am 40 years young, so I represent, I know I look a lot younger, but. Um, I represent a, you know, part of the hip hop generation, I believe, that failed the civil rights generation and failed Phillips' generation. Um, when we talk about artists are the keepers of truth, I would disagree that's the case with, um, you know, with the people that we ascribe as leaders today. Um, how do I say this without, like, okay, while there aren't, uh, um, signs that say Negroes, Latinos keep out. There are the spiritual signs there and our leaders are doing business with them. And I think 
that capitalism has definitely trumped um, self-determination with my generation. And that's why we failed you miserably. And that's why the tit that we're talking about was dried up. But, so it's really, really, um, like I don't, how many, how many Trayvons need to exist before we do something about it? You know, these are distractions. This is why the only thing I would say um, that I would disagree with um, Mr. Belafonte on is identity, you know, not being at the forefront of this crisis. I think it is. I think we need to continue to do that work to really uh, become grounded because we are generation, like I'm the product, we're the product. My hip hop generation is a product of, you know, um, the, our parents were uh, of the crack era, um, Vietnam vets, you know, some, some people, some of the progenitors of the culture, uh, the graffiti artists, started writing as a way to get out of their homes because their brothers are coming back from the Vietnam War with PTSD and you know, creating drama in the house. So they're out there, they're disenfranchised. You, know, you have like, this culture that really um, is kind of left out there and now it was just picked up by a corporation. And, you what know, would you say was uh, that moment? In, what would you say was that moment in my remarks that led you to believe that I thought that identity wasn't important? Well, toward the end, I didn't say that you said it was not important. Oh. I said that it may, that you may have um, thought it to be a distraction or something that's not as important as everything else that we're facing today. I think identity is, a, is we're, we're, we are facing, I think, an identity crisis that's exacerbated from, that's been exacerbated over the last five decades. So I, I think we actually, not only do we want to hear from Philip on this, and I want to ask a specific question, but feel free to go in anywhere that responds to what's been said, which is, does Dream Defenders have a kind of cultural uh, component to it in terms of workshopping? Obviously, you are using spoken word poetry. You are using an artistic voice mm -hmm. to communicate these powerful messages. Um, but within the space of organizing Dream Defenders, mm -hmm. does art and culture actually play a critical part? It's, it's, at, it's almost at the center of what we're doing. Um, so for us, um, I think, and I'm going to get a little meta a little bit, uh, if y'all will let me, but art and artists um, must be, um, must be, okay? So let me say that. I don't want to get into the place of saying must be at the forefront because, you know, then we get in a debate on who should be at the forefront, but we must need art. We must have art. Why? Um, the artist by nature um, imagines what is beyond what we can see. They see a wall, we see a wall, and they see something drastically different. You watch a dancer at war with gravity, right? I grew up with music. I grew up with music. Music did more for me than any class up until college, possibly. Um, the improvisation, the camaraderie that you feel with your, your chamber, I, I play classical music, uh, with, your, with your chamber group, um, is something that has been taken out of our schools, um, taken out of our communities, but not, not for the reasons they've said, not for fiscal reasons, but because the nature of the artist is to imagine a possibility that is not seen. Um, so, and, so, and so when you look, when you look at the word dream and the, and the ability to imagine the possibility, is that me? I don't know who it is. This is the craziest thing. The, the, <laughs> the, the ability, maybe it is me. The ability to imagine possibility. Um, it is something that has systematically been robbed or taken away from, our, from generations of people. And, and we like to say that, you know, that the system is not broken. It was designed this way and it's working spectacularly. Mm -hmm. If you take away a child's ability, and I don't have anything against STEM, I don't have anything against the studies of technology and math and engineering, but if the emphasis of our government, right, well, under the guise that it will better prepare our students for work, right? Better prepare our students to produce and become more productive people um, is leading us down a very slippery slope. If you take away a child and a young person's ability to imagine the impossible, right? 
a, a young person's ability, the, the, the endorphins that go off in a young person's brain at the sight of art or the experience of dance or at the experience of music um, is enough to, to spark a revolution, right? Artists have done it. Comedians challenge us on stage to see things and to talk about things through laughter that we couldn't do up here even. Right. And so art must be at the center. It must be the centerpiece A cultural. We've reached a point now where capitalism has become so pervasive that it is it is eroded our culture. Right. And so a cultural revolution is very is as important as a political and economic one um, in the way that we see it. And so when I. Uh, use Drake lyrics and, and, and Kendrick Lamar lyrics is not to pander to the hip hop generation. It's because this is the way uh, we're, we're trying to take back the culture, right? And so we don't see it as just quoting somebody. We're calling upon, when we say good kids, mad cities, we're calling upon our culture to come back to us, right? So our goal is when Kendrick Lamar in, in a few months, hopefully, he hears us talking about good kids, mad cities, and they say, what, what do you have to say about it? And he tries to explain his album, and they say, well, what about these young people who are talking about racial profiling in their cities? We're calling our culture back to us. And so um, it's our goal um, to politicize folks through music, through art, through television, through every medium that we can that's been usurped by the oppressor. Um, but also to make art revolutionary again and to allow for young people to feel like because it, it, if I want to be an artist, a challenger of, of the current status quo, that I can be that and it is revolutionary and it's not something where the, 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 the art kids sit over there and the thinkers sit over here. Um, and so I feel like I rambled, but it is, it is at the center of what we're doing. It's crucial to what we're doing. And if we ignore it, if we ignore it, we will fall on deaf ears and hearts. Can I, can I to echo this point, so the next quote, um, we're ready for it, and I'll read it aloud as I have been. Yes, in a fundamental sense, only a cultural revolution can save our country. At this moment of great crisis, a revolution that will unbrainwash the entire American people, for we have all been the victims of a mighty brainwash that has continued unabated for the last 500 years. And what I, just to reinforce both the historical perspective that this, this person in 1964 is speaking to us in this moment also suggests exactly Raquel's point. Mm -hmm. And that point being that that consciousness and awareness, the work that Mr. Belafonte described became the focus of the attack mm -hmm. to make possible the recreation of new forms of oppression right. that imprisoned people right. in their capacity to, to transform their communities. So not for nothing, mm -hmm. Mexican-American descendant children are being attacked in terms of the education about the part of the country that used to be Mexico. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm -hmm. as anti-American. Mm -hmm. exactly. Not for nothing that we've divested of arts and music, that, mm -hmm. that it's less important, as you describe, to math and reading literacy. Mm -hmm. I'm beginning to even wonder if the Trojan horse of STEM focus is really a new language of vocational training. It is. That, that it sounds like it we, want to, we want to have engineers, but really what we're saying is we need some people to push some buttons yes. at some computers while, while others do other things more important. Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm sorry. But I'm it done. Is, it, is, it, is about, it is about creating an, a, um, or continuing to create a populace of people who, who produce, who are able to produce under the guise of making us competitive in a global market. The, the reason is, is so, but it is a bait and switch because what it does is we've got governors, I think Pat McCrory from North Carolina um, in his plan on talking about STEM and productivity and more jobs for the state um, denounces the arts. Um, and and that, that's not, it's not a mistake. And it is, it is the Trojan horse. And if we don't take back culture, we must have a cultural revolution. 
Um, because like you said, we don't, I, I personally be believe culture is the way that we're socialized now. Young people are socialized now. You learn your place in society through your films, through your music, through our YouTube, through whatever. That is how young people are learning their place in society now because there are no signs. There are no whites only. There are no, um, and, and, and the schools don't, you know, we can, that's a whole nother thing, but we're being cultured um, through our music. That is the medium that it's happening in through our films, we talked about the murder of, of um, Jordan Davis, and we talk about the murder of Trayvon Martin, and just for, not for nothing, right? We are as responsible for Trayvon Martin as we are for George Zimmerman, okay? Every day, George Zimmerman, and I'm not advocating for any amount of sympathy, right? Don't, don't get me twisted. But every day, George Zimmerman awoke in a world that told him that young black people were dangerous, okay? Look, so, so liken it to this. Every day you wake up and you find out, you, you, you are told that lions are bad. Lions are very bad. They will eat you. They will eat you. And the, a lion walks in here. You are going to try to kill that. You are going to run or you're going to do whatever you can to kill. And so it's a cycle that we have in, the, in our culture, right, where we indoctrinate people to think and act in certain ways. And then we attack Zimmerman um, for a variety of reasons, some founded, some unfounded. But it allows us to diffuse responsibility for our part in raising George Zimmerman in raising Michael Dunn, a grown man afraid of a car full of kids. You understand? And so... Can I interject? And what does it say about our culture that we're celebrating the second anniversary of Trayvon Martin's death the same month that George Zimmerman gets catapulted into celebrity status? Mm -hmm. yeah. So he, he's being essentially rewarded, right? For, 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 for playing out the justice system or whatever. It's a, I mean, yeah. it's a vicious cycle. I mean, but no, no, one is, no one is exempt, is what I'm saying. And I think, I, I think that is the biggest problem that we have today. And, and this is a moment for us. Um, Mr. B got me kind of hyped a little bit. I think, we need, I, I think we need independent political economic power. And we have an opportunity here um, within the current structure to build a third party. Um, and I believe that... Um, if you look at the numbers and you look at the time that we're in, um, that neither party represents the views and, and, and the needs and desires of many people in this room. And, if, and so, and so if, if we're to make this country ungovernable, we've got to shut it down, right? We've got, we've got to engage in direct action um, that's strategic, um, that's plentiful, hopefully, when we have capacity and um, that gets us somewhere. But I think an answer, not the answer, but an answer is to completely replace representation in government. Um, because personally, I'm really tired of um, going to marches about, about folks that we've lost, right? Um, we can't forget them, but when, when do we stop counterpunching? When do we stop reacting? Um, and so that's a kind of a question I want to, I want to, I'm so sorry. This is, no, no, you, this is terrific. This is terrific. So we are about to enter Q&A and I want to enter Q&A picking up right at that space, right? Because you, you're talking about organizing, you're talking about third parties, you're talking about in a very indirect way, the status quo. And so the very last slide is going to launch us into a Q&A. That's not the, the, the next one. Oh. So, Mr. B, you have to see this slide. <laughs> yes. Oh, I see. So this is uh, an illustration, and I apologize I can't give the um, illustrator credit. Um, accompanied a New York Times op-ed on February 24th called uh, Obama Crime and Punishment. And uh, what the illustrator is noting here the theme of the article by Bill Keller, who is leaving the New York Times to launch 
a, a new media campaign around mass incarceration mm -hmm. uh, is counting the days for the president to initiate a, shall we say, more robust response to the problem of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So I thought this would be a great segue to the Q&A part of this to sort of reflect upon, if anyone wants to, uh, the relationship of these issues to our formal political representatives and political parties. So the floor is open. There will be someone. Um, OK, so there's two mics on either side. You'll have to come down. Um, we want to hear from as many people and make this as much of a dialogue as we can, which means that if you're talking as long as I'm talking, then you're talking too long. <laughs> Either make a comment, which is OK. I'm not one of these people who you know, is going to yell at you because you didn't ask a question. But if you have something to say, say it, and then that's it. Please do not say, make a comment and then a question. And if it's going to be a preface, it has to be eight words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a question. Can y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, my name is Angelo Dickey. And um, I'm one of them guys that y'all talking about. I was on the block with a lot of dudes for the last 35 years. So I do really have something I really need to say. Race matters because every day I'm called a thug. Every single day. When I look at the police, they don't ask me, do I need help? They ask me, what are you doing? Why are you busting my balls? That's what the police says to me every day in Harlem. They say that to me in the polo grounds. So what I need to say for the guys that's on the block that's not here to articulate what y'all are saying, and I thank y'all for having such things like this because it gives me something else to do besides standing on the block and being counted on to get arrested. I've been arrested more times than y'all can count. I just didn't do time because I was doing miscellaneous crimes and not felonious crimes. <laughs> now that said that, this is what we need to do. We have a lot of intelligent people right here right now Instead of waiting for blocks of money, let's take our minds. We got a thing called social network. Let's network because I don't want to leave this earth to my son and his daughter that it's still got to be the same thing that was Mr. Belafonte when you was a young man. We need a chance to try something different. There's no more, the brother said something about a political party. I'm absolutely 100%. I've been voting since Reagan. I've been voting. I vote in anything. I don't care what it is. I owe that to the slave. So I might be taking a little more time, but the slave ain't here. I'm representing him. Right now, this is what I'm saying to everyone in here. It's not about pointing fingers at no one, saying that your, your opinion is small and my opinion is right. It's not about that. It's about now, let's build houses, because the foundation of houses has been going on for billions of years. But guess what? The house looks better, but you still got to build a foundation to make it happen, no matter what, no matter who does it. So what we need to do today as people is try to understand race does matter, but it shouldn't be the defining moment of what we are as human beings. We're supposed to be human beings first and then go about race. Because I'm no matter what you say, you're gonna be I'm black. It's not gonna change. I'm black. No matter how many white people I get along with and build business with, I'm gonna be black. So so therefore, with that said, let's try this on a more humanistic level and not so much on who's right and who's wrong. Thank you. It was a comment, um, if you'd like, a wonderful call to us to build community, is what I heard, and absolutely be respectful of our humanity, our shared humanity. Uh. Yes, I want to uh, uh, put on the record the death of Chokwe Lumumba, the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. And Chokwe, Chokwe exemplified our hope for revolutionary political change. And uh, I just, it's important that people remember Chuck Wait. <laughs> okay, that's all. Hello, good evening. Awesome conversation and dialogue. My question is, it's an age-old debate, just are we better or worse off as a country as a result of segregation? And maybe come at it more so from an economic standpoint, just as far as like small and minority-owned businesses and things, and sometimes we may not always have the resources, like grocery stores and things like that. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. So I just got finished reading a book called Our Black Year, which is where this, a lot of this is coming from. So yeah. I'm looking at Mr. B. Are we better off? Uh, that's such a relative question. You know, are we better off aspiring to what? Or are we better off having left what? Uh, I can best answer that by saying that uh, in the 20th century, we saw a lot of incarnations of different attempts and uh, uh, mobilizations to change the landscape of oppression. Uh, a lot happened in that century. Africa rose up and sought to overthrow the shackles of uh, being colonized. Race in America was doing its thing, apartheid in South Africa doing its thing. The Vietnamese people were striking a blow for their independence after centuries and centuries of conquest. We all got somehow deeply intertwined with one another's space because the forces that manipulated those pages of history were the ones that determined the pro and the con, the push and the pull. If America decided not to go into Vietnam, what would have happened to us if the Vietnamese people had been left to their own methodology and realized what they have realized anyway after all of the, the stuff that we went through? I genuinely believe that the, the forces of power that have garnished unbridled capital are the controllers of the game. And in that context, there was no fair level or fair playing field for us to compete with them because they controlled everything. Mm -hmm. They not only controlled the mediums of communication, or the medium of, but they also control the style in which we do things. They control uh, talking about culture and art. It is no, it's very interesting to watch the Koch brothers walk in and buy up all the cultural institutions. They have walked in, and I go to Lincoln Center, and I don't see the New York State Theater, the Performing Arts. I see the Koch brothers. They have Koch Auditorium. I go to the museum, I don't see natural history, just as a place to go and look at the wonders of civilization. I walk in, and I'm looking at the David Koch Atrium. I go up to the hospital to get my checkup, and I go to uh, Columbia Presbyterian, and uh, I discovered that the uh, Koch brothers just bought it. <laughs> they just put up all the money to decide how health care will be administered and not administered. Uh, almost everything that's touched by the Koch brothers in their contamination of power is guaranteed to keep us in a place of subservience. That's how they think, that's what they do. Any other discussion, I think, that dismisses or does not find those facts relevant to what we do every day when we get up is forcing us to miss the target we should be aiming at. I don't want to hear any more about who's white and who's yellow and who's green. I'm not saying that those definitions are not worthy of recognition once in a while, but it's not central to my debate. My debate is uh, uh, how do we galvanize the planet to eventually say that there's a way in which we can stop what's been happening to us only if we take the bit in our teeth and run the race. Uh, can add, if you'd like. Next question. Um, first and foremost, I want to say it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here at this forum and um, at this discussion amongst such a, an amazing panel as you folks. Um, given like uh, Raquel Sapeda, my parents were also Dominican immigrants, and uh, it was brought in the it was brought up in the uh, discussion in the beginning that um, the problem that as far as we've come from the '60s, the civil rights era till now, it's been like we've we've progressed, and that farce continues today because of having a black president at the White House, not knowing that he still represents the same agendas that were brought by the people before him, his predecessors. So 
It's, it, the young man over here brought a good, he brought up a good point about having more political parties to represent us. I, I never understood how in a nation of 300 million people, we only have two political parties that represent everybody else. It doesn't make much sense to me how you have uh, 300 million citizens of this country and only two parties represent us. The, the numbers don't add up. So we need to find a way that we can basically start some type of cultural revolution and bring more political parties to the stage that represent you and me and, and everyone else's agenda here. And that was a good part that he brought up because I've always had these conversations and these, these discussions at work. Um, I've been employed with the New York City Police Department for 14 years now. Um, I thought I could come into the system, into the machine, into the matrix, thinking I could make a difference. And, <laughs> and I was wrong to find out I can't make a difference from within. But if we all get together and we all speak about these issues and we all discuss the differences that, that exist and the farce that's, that's inside the White House, because that's what I call the president. I call him a farce. He's, he's, he's a make-believe. He's a puppet. And if we come to the, realization, to the realization that he doesn't represent us and we need to find leaders that represent us, then we can slowly progress to where we want to be in, a, let's say, next 20, 30 years. So I want to see that. Um, yeah, I, I think that just the farce is that he's the president of black America. You know, he's, <laughs> he's the president of an imperialist uh, country. And, uh, I, you know, for all intents and purposes, if you're, if you're grading him on the right scale, he's doing an exemplary job. He's, uh, he's deporting, he's, uh, he's deporting, he's conquering, he's pillaging, he's incarcerating. Um, and, uh, I put him up there with some of the best presidents that we've had. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't expect, I, I never, I never expected um, President Obama, um, if, if, if you analyze how he got to the office, um, and if you analyze who kept him in office and who advises him, uh, um, we, we, we can't, couldn't have expected. And I do think that he succeeded in pacifying a, a large number of folks against um, criticizing the office of the presidency or criticizing um, decisions because then you, you were airing our, our dirty laundry um, out in front of everybody. But um, I think uh, as president of the United States of America that he is he is, he's been doing what, what he's been asked of him, um, not by the people, but the people um, rarely, rarely have the year of the president, so. No, just to add, and I know I keep on talking about this from a very holistic place, but you know, I feel like in order for us to, to, to move this ideal into action, we do have to do the work. Um, to really, um, you know, create, redefine the American dream and create our own identities. Um, because I keep on hearing these things in panels. You know, we want to have our own party. We want to do. We want to do that. We want to move into action. And then, you know, a week goes by. We're back at McDonald's. We're lethargic. We're doing. It. It's like, you know, it's so. It's 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 really. I really implore people to like, you know, do that work. Can, well. Uh I thought that, that before we take the next question, I just have to make an observation that in a lot of the developing countries or in the places that are called developing countries, in my visit to these countries, uh, I look at the voting process and I look at what, what shapes the democratic character of the society they aspire to. And most of these places have multiple parties. I look on a list of things, I see 37 parties. Some of them got pictures next to them, so you know who it is you're voting for, all the details, all the directions are given. Multiple parties or the absence of multiple parties, I don't think is a deterrent. Mm -hmm. What I think it is, is those who manipulate the system, multiple parties, one party, no party, whatever, those who shape the system's productivity, who controls it, who runs it, and who keeps it in check. The United States of America, from its incarnation, has declared itself on the issue of race. The Native Americans who were found here were people, from what I've heard about this, 
They were greed. They greeted the European. They came. They participated in the vastness of what this continent had to offer. And in not too long thereafter, they were subjugated to genocide. They were subjugated to oppression. They were subjugated to become the servants of those who conquered. When they ran out and there were no more of them left, they went and got black people from Africa, which incidentally I think is a coincidence. If their people have gone to Africa and found nothing but white folks, they'd have, they'd have enslaved them too. That's the nature of the, 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 the political and economic mechanism. And where I think we have to get off of is to try to shape what we have within the box we have been put into. Mm -hmm. We have to think outside the box. So rather than make a, rather than make a claim for multiple parties or one party, I say, what, do you, what is your claim for how you want to be governed mm -hmm. and shape the instruments of governance around what people truly need? And I think that, you know, just one last thing on the arts. There's hardly a thing that we do in life that is not at the behest of or at the doorstep of the arts. If you are deeply religious and you believe in the religious dogma or the religious philosophy, uh, all that you know about religion is what artists tell you. They wrote the Bible. They wrote the Quran. They made all the characters. They had the fantasyful idea that uh, Christ walked on water and uh, did all that stuff. Only a great writer could have done that. I wish I had him as a screenwriter. <laughs> but if you look at the temples in which we live, guard artists put all that stained glass window and design the, 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 uh, the content of our architectural delights. Uh, Mozart wrote all the music we sing in church. Everywhere you go, artists are at the doorstep of what we know. Starting with the caveman and the drawings you see on the wall. I once had a friend that said to me, is your art authentic? And I said, what's authentic art? And he said, well, you know, you get the folk music and people walk in and they distort. I said, listen, brother, the first song was Ugg. <laughs> The first utterance from a human being's throat that suggested something musical was taking place was Ugg. Everything since Ugg by the Neanderthal has been a distortion. <laughs> so don't get me caught up in what is art supposed to do and supposed to say you're just manipulating what the, what the instrument is. Art is, Robeson said, the gatekeepers of truth, because it is how we record it, how we define it, how we state it, and what our children read from what we leave behind that determines how we extend the idea of civilization and what we do. Uh, I just need to say that because I'm not making a case for the artist as some elite instrument or something terribly uh, uh, out of service and sync. It's just critical to our being, whether you want it or not. It is interesting to notice that every empire that ever existed in the history of man or human beings or the world, that history is replete with societies conquering two things in the very beginning, mm -hmm. control culture and art and control women. Not necessarily in that order. But you get the, there's something about that consistent pattern of oppression. Somebody got that understood in the beginning that here's the trick to the game. And we play into it. I sit with artists all the time, some of them vulgarly rich. And I sit down often and they say to me, man, uh, uh, you know, I'm so glad you didn't struggle and you, what you did is so, what courage. Uh, and uh, you sacrificed so much. Now listen to this shiver. And I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, why are you moaning, mourning, you know? Where do you see my failure? Where do you see my sacrifice? According to your trajectory, according to your destination, I gave up something. I don't have $400 million, but is that what I set out to get? Uh-uh, what I got, I got. 
You wake up every morning and talk to your manager, your agent, your bank. I wake up every morning and I talk to Nelson Mandela. Tell me which one got the better deal. Hey. Okay. Um, the last on this. It's not so much, well, I think we have to do it to define the instruments that we use to articulate our needs. But I think we have to be far more precise in who controls our needs and who are we targeting. What are we really saying here? The church is inextricably bound to the bank. The bank is inextricably bound to exploitation. America, by the very nature of how it is designed, its economic imperial thing, says we have to have cheap markets. If you put a face on a cheap market, it's a woman suffering somewhere in the Congo trying to chop cotton and being raped. Mm -hmm. That's what cheap markets mean. It means people are dysfunctional, oppressed, poor, so that those who are rich can get even richer. But let's focus on that for a minute. You know, uh, Let's focus on all of us who are the victims of that fact. Don't we have some collective need to do something about it? Don't we have some collective sense of survival that says, we're skinning the wrong cat. You know, when I talk to Chuck D and I talk to all the guys, you know, yo, the, we talk about oppression with women and the hip hop culture, which is the most pervasive force on, in terms of pop culture on the face of the earth, has done the most to demonize, demonize women. And if you stand in here as a black man, Holland Ho and bitch and, and all the things we do, how can you then talk about your daughter and talk about your mother? And who's her pimp? Who does her? How do you become impersonal to the way in which you describe women? How do you become impersonal to color? How do you become impersonal to all of these things? By just somehow saying, I'm an artist, I can write it as I see it. And uh, uh, it's freedom of speech all of these colorations and things that step in that just really blur what the story is about. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. B. <laughs> okay, so, so now the stakes are even higher for an efficient <laughs> statement or question. Um, well, I would first just like to thank Mr. Belafonte for everything you've done for me and all of us here in, in your life. If you know, I know if you weren't... If you didn't do what you did, I wouldn't be able to be here, you know? And I, I had a question about um, what you did with, with Miriam Makiba and whatnot um, was beautiful. And you, I, I, I feel like, I, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you have, over the, over the course of your career and life, you've become more active and more militant in terms of you know speaking and you know just being being out there and saying what's really going on, um, and I, I'm a musician, and I was I kind of wanted to get some advice on, like the the difference between being like radical and militant and kind of like sweeping in and like being approachable, you know, like with, with my art and well, from from what you have done with with your art, you know, I've, I feel like I've 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 seen things of you being like you know, very approachable and charismatic and white people loved you, you know, and Amer no, I'm, no, I'm, and you know, white, white America, you know, they, they brought you in and, um, you know, and you, you were able to, with that, say what you had to say and now you can come here and say what really needs to be said. So I just wanted to know some, some advice on, you know, the, the difference between the two, you know? So, so, and so where how you come to be from? a progressive, radical artist who white people love. <laughs> I didn't know I did that. <laughs> I think, let me just take this, this vessel and take it on another <laughs> path of navigation. I am an activist who became an artist, as opposed to an artist who became an activist. When, when 
I stepped into the world of the arts, I was a, out of the Second World War, high school dropout, didn't even finish first term high. Uh, volunteered, went off to that struggle, came back, and uh, had no skills. I was, I, I had learned a lot from that war and learned a lot about camaraderie and dependence on other human beings for survival. All that stuff was there, but the, nothing prepared me for the world in which I then entered again. Uh, I was a janitor's assistant. I did menial jobs, did a little repair in a building, got a gratuity, two tickets to go to the basement of a library in Harlem to see a play. I didn't even know what a play was. I knew what the theater was because I'd been to the Apollo. I saw Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald and Chick Webb and all that early stuff and delighted in the dance hall, but I didn't see theater. I never knew quite what a play was and all this. I walked into this place out of curiosity. First of all, I was pissed off that I got a ticket instead of a money. <laughs> so I just said, where's my gratuity? And the, state and the tenant got away. Anyway, when I walked into this place, an epiphany, you know, it was epiphany. The silence in the place. What the players did when they got on stage. What they articulated. I'm a black Serviceman looking for America. The play was called Home is the Hunter. And that meant that black people were being interpreted on stage as having these conflicts, black men in particular. When I saw them inspire and I saw them instruct, when I saw them reach moments emotionally where people could laugh and be sad and be concerned and you listen to utterances, I said, this is an arena of remarkable power. I mean, I've never seen anything like this where some people get up on a stage and start reciting some verse and people are being manipulated into emotional space to come out with conclusion of thought. I, said, I want to reside there. I want to be in that game. I want to know what theater is about and what it does. It was a physical space, but it was reflecting a bigger abstract, the world of the arts. The more I got into that, those artists of the day that came to talk to us as young people in the basement of this theater in Harlem brought social mission. When you saw Langston Hughes, when you saw uh, Paul Robeson, when you saw Canada Lee, when you saw the people who came in and talked, Robeson didn't say, you know, get a good agent and uh, uh, make sure you, 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 you hook up with so-and-so because if you get the you'll be a star. And rich. That wasn't the game at all. As a matter of fact, I didn't aspire to be some kind of a prominent figure in the arts. I aspired just to participate because what the arts was saying filled me with a sense of purpose and gave me a destination. In this context, I saw art as a social instrument all the plays I read with Shakespeare, all the things that school failed to nourish and to inspire in me to want to learn and made me a dropout was now attracting me to the space because knowledge was important, ability to read. But it wasn't so much just to read, it's what I read. And I look at Shakespeare, I said, what a great social revolutionary. He's taken on all the establishment and he's shown it in its rawest presence. As, as uh, failed empires and kings and queens and treachery, and they even got Othello in there talking about what happens to the Moor. I looked at this thing, I said, here's where I've got to roam. All of us come to this space with some sense of what our destination must be. But my daughter first suggested she wanted to be in, th in the arts and in theater. My first question to her, why do you want to be there? What is it that attracts you to that arena? I knew that she knew, saw my example, but I also know what might have motivated her because all of her peers and other people that I spoke to really had their eyes on stardom, really had their eyes on the ego of it, the narcissism of it, the fulfillment of it, the power of it, the material possession, the access to, 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 to special treatment, none of which had anything to do with the arts. That's a consequence of things that you do. It wasn't what it is. And most of the people that I go to in acting classes and acting studios don't speak.
speak to the arts from that perspective. They speak to the arts from the perspective of what is the new television series, what is the new this, what, and I shape my existence in the arts to meet this factory of exploitation that doesn't give me any sense of purpose. So the arts for me is a sacred environment, and what you do with it is based upon what do you want to give? What do you want to sacrifice for? What do you want to use it to say? So we're, we're almost out of time, and we may not get to every question out of respect to Mr. Belafonte and our guests. I do want to encourage the questioners to uh, think about things that haven't been discussed, areas that we might not have covered. So if you have somewhere to take us, yeah. different than where we've been in a little bit of time, that would be great. So you're up. Yes. One last, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I have a question um, for Ms. Cepeda and Mr. Agnew about um, the role of mental health and identity. Um, to Ms. Cepeda, I just want to know, um, when it comes to identity, who are we looking to affirm our identity? Um, and in doing that, when you're working with youth, Mr. Agnew, are we focusing on mental health, on mental health of not just the children, but of the situations that they're coming from, as most of us are children of the crack generation who've experienced lots of trauma? Well, I, right now, I'm working on a documentary um, where I follow a group of young Latina teenagers that are um, part of the only arts-driven um, program in the country that helps them deal with you know, their, their, their issues. And when I first started going there to volunteer and just talk to them about, you know, um, um, job opportunities and a career in the media, I started seeing like some things coming up, like certain themes about not feeling like they belong anywhere and not having an identity and accepting what, what their teachers tell them they are and what their um, communities tell them they are. And many times their parents are not there to engage with them because they're so busy trying to survive. And you know, some of the girls that I worked with um, haven't never even left the Bronx. So, and I couldn't even wrap my head around that. So um, the way I started working with identity with them was just by doing like a fun project where we did ancestral DNA testing, mitochondrial DNA testing. And you know, most of them uh, came out to have either an indigenous background or a West African background, and them being Latino, they were like, well, I didn't even know this, what, why am I African? And, and from there they learned about the transatlantic slave trade and about how, you know, even though they have these feelings of wanting to not be here anymore, they're finding out that they're proving by their existence, right, that they're proving that the indigenous people were not wiped out the way that we learn in history. We learn in history that, for example, Christopher Columbus came to the Dominic when he came to the Dominican Republic in Haiti, Hispaniola, that in the first three decades, um, every, every uh, indigenous person was wiped out. We're finding out more and more that they're surviving the way other cultures do in fragments. So these girls, I brought them to the Dominican Republic so they can see some of the sites and some of the, you know, these old drawings, you know, the oldest form of graffiti to me. Um, and they just, on their own came up with this like this sense of wanting to stay and saying like well if I survived if my ancestors survived for me they survived through all of this they survived even what academia said right uh, genocide by academia then I owe it to myself and to my descendants to survive and then they started um, on their own really starting to uh, draw these self portraits and some of the young girls who were let's say for the lack of a better phrase Afro Dominican that were drawing themselves as blonde and blue-eyed young women we're now incorporating this history and being very proud of it in their artwork. So where they cannot, they cannot articulate exactly what they're feeling, seeing, feeling, they're showing me through their artwork and that to me is really empowering. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say we're, we're a very new organization and so um, we haven't been as intentional about weaving mental health into the way that we um, do our work is something that I hope to, you know, maybe in maybe two, three years, if I'm ever invited back, to be able to provide a better answer for um, in the way that we do our work. Um, but there is a dissonance, right, growing up African American or minority or not a part of the power structure in this country that you inevitably every day feel like there's something wrong with you. Um, 
Um, I, I have a history of depression in my family. Um, it is something, it is the reason actually um, why I am involved in this work because I saw my mother and my father um, go through um, that every single day, um, not being what this country told them they were supposed to be, not being able to provide um, the material possessions that four young boys begged them for, um, and um, how that affected their psyche and their view of themselves. I too battle often, right, with not feeling as good, even though um, it is a part of our work to inspire. Um, you can't, I can't deny that, you know, I, I, you know, uh, I don't want to call it a chemical imbalance because I don't believe it to be that to be fully what it is. Um, you know, I can't deny that I have certain oppression that I have to fight off every day, right? Um, and so I think mental health is something that we've got to be more intentional about addressing. Um, it's the ways that we address, address it. Um, identity, um, telling young people that you, it, you are fully human and right and, 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 and born um, the way that you were supposed to be. And it's just from day one that you've been told opposite. And um, that is a part of our work, but it's not a part that I've been um, able to, to, to accurately lay out for you and how we do it. Um, but I know we do do it because I've seen, I've seen young people go from um, relative mute to, 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 a, to a level that, that will make you cry. You, you understand? Because they've realized that they are who they are and it is everything that is supposed to be and they are enough and more than enough and it, your cup will run over um, seeing that. So um, mental health is important. We should talk about it. Um, we've got a, 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 we don't talk about it in the black community. We don't go to doctors. But I'd venture to say that there aren't enough doctors in the world um, to cure um, a culture that tells you that you are evil and against everything that is right and well with the world. Um, and so we're just addressing the symptoms and not the system. How about... <laughs> really quickly, how about creating something... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can write to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we'll talk. Yes. And uh, I, just as a... Uh, I'm going to editorialize on this for a second. The, tro the tropes and the discourse of, of black mental illness has another dark side that people should just be conscious of. Um, and it's an old problem. So it's not to deny that mental health and its lack of, and the lack of an infrastructure to deal with mental health problems for poor people in general, for black, for Latino, for whites, et cetera, is absolutely a problem in our countries. Um, but we shouldn't overplay the mental health problem because one could make a counter narrative argument that black people's ability to turn to um, alternative forms of creative expression have provided far more mental sanity in the midst of real chaos and trauma, uh -huh. i.e. the spiritual, the blues, the jazz, that have not been echoed in other cultures. Uh -huh. um, and because we tend not to racialize um, mental illness and, and self-destructive behavior and pathology and self-medication from alcohol to narcotics outside of black and brown communities. We tend to think of them as, as non-deviant spaces and tend to over-pathologize the mental problems in our communities. I, I, just, I just had to put that in, the, in circulation. Yeah. So. All right, how you doing everyone? Panel, it's great to see you guys here. Mr. Belavante, um, my name is Stephen Fowler. I'm a senior at the new school. I study in the jazz department. I'm a trumpet player. And um, I saw you, I think it was January 21st or something like that, at the Schoenberg. And I had a question for you earlier then. Didn't really get a chance to get addressed, but I asked you again. Um, in your 87 years, you're 87, correct? Yeah. Something like that. Okay, it's cool. Got to get to it. Okay, yep. all right, thank you. 
in your 87 years of service for the black community, do you have any explanation as to why activism has seemed to become more speculative and less active? What effect has social media and networks have on the urgency of activism? Has it made the black community more complacent, psychologically speaking? I'll just, can I do mine? I don't mind to rob you of the second time they ask me. Oh, actually, I'd, I'd actually like Mr. Belafonte to answer my question. At 87, we move a little slower. Go right ahead. Uh, nah, oh, nah, God, yeah. go on. Oh, you want to? Yeah. Listen, I'll be real quick. I, I promise you I'll be quick. Listen, I don't think it's just a hallmark of this generation. And, and actually, this will suffice as my closing. We have a, we've always had an issue with the diffusion of responsibility, okay? L listen, I think 50 years ago in New York, there was a woman named Kitty Genovese, okay? She was murdered in Queens on the street. The reason the story is even remembered by any of us is because 38 people saw her heard her screams, and didn't call the police, uh -huh. okay? And the, the, the quote from one of the people was say, that said, I just didn't want to be involved, uh -huh. right? And so I think one thing th there may, and this is only in my reading, there is a myth that everybody was involved in the civil rights movement, okay? Uh -huh. they're, 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 and, and, and today, even now, we do have a speculative society. But it is to the benefit of movements and leaders who want to be sole leaders that it is like this, right? We have entered into an era where we must have, or else we will not survive collective leadership. And we must, we must. If the diffusion of responsibility is if they, they believe someone else is going to do it for them. Someone else is going to call the police. Someone else is going to do it for me. And for years, organizations, I won't name any, have benefited from that belief because they say, look, I got you. You don't have to do anything. I'm going to do it for you, absolving you of responsibility, right? And so we've always, as a culture, right, we've always, as a culture, said there are a few that will do it for us, and we can watch. Somebody else is going to do something about it. And so my point is two things. One, I don't believe our generation is an anomaly. I believe we are very voyeuristic and very narcissistic, but it is a hallmark of people to diffuse responsibility for taking part. Listen, everybody in here knows about mass incarceration. Everybody in here knows about racial profiling. Everybody in here knows about uh, domestic violence. But you come looking for somebody else to do it. Some, some other organization, and not everybody. This is not an, in the, in the, in the, it's not an indictment on everybody. But some, some, some. And, but, but what I do believe, bro, is that we have an opportunity with a complement of social media, right? to really re reach a tipping point where we really have a mass movement of people, right? Because right now, there is right now a diffusion, a huge diffusion of responsibility. The Obama will do it, the government will do it, NAACP will do it, Urban League will do it for us, the Dream Defenders feel he gonna do it, he got it, he's gonna do it, Dream Defenders is gonna, it's not gonna happen like that. And it's not ever going to happen like that. And that's what, we're, that's what I think we're missing out on. If, if you came here looking for answers from me, I'm going to be Socratic with you. Because, listen, <laughs> we, the only way this movement can really truly grow for us, from what I'm saying, this is only, I can only speak to my personal experience. The only way it'll happen is if it's a collective-led movement. Everybody has a hand in it, right? That means if you're an artist, that means if you're an artist, 
and, 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 and you play the trumpet, that means that you're radicalized and that you know you have a place in advancing the, the needs of our people, and it comes through every time you blow into that trumpet. That means if you're a lawyer, you, you are radicalized, and we have a collective vision for the future of our people, and when you go into the courtroom, you're defending people with a vigor that, that has nothing to do with the system and what it's been taught. It means if you're a doctor, you're doing the same thing with your hands. And so it's not going to be a speculate. We got to kill the hero. You could kill the villain. Kill the heroes. You could kill the villain. There's not anybody that's going to come save us. No one's going to come save us. Not one group is going to come save us. Philip Dream Defender is not going to come to New York and save nobody. It's people in here that can do it. And so it must be collective led. And in order to want to do that, we have to learn how to like ourselves and see what we have in common with one another. Yeah. You can't be waiting a long time. You gotta give it a my bad, man. You heard my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just uh, make this additional observation. We do not sit without being counseled into this inertia. We are led to it by everyday rituals that we have in our midst. Uh, let me start first back again to the church. I do not want to be deferred anymore in my anguish to God's grace and that God will step into this mess and just pass a miracle and we're in. Yet hundreds of millions of people are instructed to believe that the relief that they seek, they're not strong enough to come up against the state. It is going to be God's will. And I think this narcotic, this thing that has numbed us into believing that there are institutions and, and, and declarations that have, been, uh, that have been there to serve us, in fact, wind up using us in the service of them. And when... Well, what... What struck me about uh, what went on down in Florida and brought me to the service of Mr. Agnew and the, the Dream Defenders was my sense of history. In my youth, I sat with communists, I sat with socialists, I sat with Marxists, I sat with religious forces. I listened to everybody's interpretation of how they saw the canvas of life. And I looked at what the church had done to me as a young Catholic growing up and what I was instructed to believe by that church. And no matter where I went, I found that there were such glaring contradictions towards what I was hearing from what the church was supposed to be to what I was experiencing from what the church was doing. If you get an entire planet of folks that are caught up in this religious distraction, how do you then wean them away from that into the idea that you must be self-sufficient, self-efficient, you must look to yourself for the solution? We've been crippled by a lot of devices that suggests that we can wait for somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. That never happens. And so the last person to step into this space to instruct us will be the church. Because the church is a huge beneficiary from our dilemma, from our pain, from our distraction, from our oppression. And not that the church, when I first met Dr. King, and we sat in the basement of the, of the church to talk about his journey, uh, I had to come clean. I had to say, look, uh, Dr. King, uh, I have to tell you that you're pressing me into the service of your cause, or the cause. Uh, I am not able to come as the kind of uh, apostle or the kind of disciple that you would perhaps want. You are of the church. I am anti-church. Are you anti-God, he said. I said, no, I'm not anti-God. I have a need to believe in God, but I do not see God in the way in which mere mortals have defined what I think the God force is. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. That doesn't mean I'm absent of morality. It doesn't mean that I'm absent of a sense of justice. But, but I don't, don't see it through the prism of the way the church would have me believe. When I got to with my little monologue, <laughs> Dr. King said, you and I are going to get along fine. <laughs> I am facing that challenge every day. The biggest resistance to my cause is the church. Mm -hmm. Now, that I'm not going to let that obstruct what I have to do. I just have to press the church to see my view. So when he went to Birmingham and did letters from a Birmingham jail and gave the clergy the benefit of his thoughts, the pureness of that thought, the direction of it, has never really rooted itself into the teachings of the church. Mm -hmm. What's most absent in the torture of women is the fact that there is no Sunday sermon every Sunday on that topic. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't talk about the exploitation and the pain mm -hmm. and the rape. And the, they, they very rarely talk about the details of how the poor suffers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they insist that the poor pay tribute mm -hmm. to Rome. Mm -hmm. So I sit in the midst of all of this, and I don't think that it was that you had options that were clearly defined for you, and you just happened to pick these things. These things are rammed down your throat every day of your life. And we have issues on them between church and state and between all the other forces that govern us. We have to take assessment of what are the forces that control us, what are the courses that teach, that force us to think in a certain way singular way? Mm. What is it that inhibits our capacity to, to become more radical in going outside the box? And one of the things that really pleases me about this institution is that when I came into it, what attracted me was that uh, nobody knew where we were going. And they said, come on in and let's search together. Radical thinking. And I think our resistance to radical thought is perhaps our greatest, uh, uh, is our greatest challenge. Yeah. It's the thing that most uh, uh, stops us from getting to the gate. You talk about Barack Obama. If you took away his skin, if you took away the color, just that one very important fact, but I'm not diminishing it. But if you take it away, has he been better or worse than most people who have occupied that uh, power, that seat? No. I think in many ways he's been better than Clinton. But yeah. Clinton is now the the... the, the uh, the, the savior of the universe because he pops up in places where the PR is powerful. But Barack Obama, I had to dismiss him very early on. I got into my class with him, points of view, and then I said, this is the wrong discussion. I'm not here to spend the rest of my time with his rule to keep defining him from day to day as to who he may be. He's declared himself. He's not particularly committed to the problems of the poor. He's not particularly committed to peace and, and, and stopping war because he has the power to be the articulator of a way in which to address these absences, and he doesn't. He doesn't speak to the deeper resonance of black people. I'm not asking him not to recognize the problem of Israel, not to recognize the problem of the Irish, not to recognize the problem of Native Americans, recognize all that, but say something about one of the most enduring, one of the most uh, significant forces of, 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 of what our oppression has experienced, and say something on it. I know you don't have the Congress because racists control that institution, and they've decided you will not make, get a vote. Well, okay, get past it. Now tell me what you're going to do with your bully pulpit and your platform. What are you going to inspire me to hit the streets doing? Where are you as an, where do you agitate? He's a great political negotiator. He's not a leader. Mm. And I think mm. we endowed him with too much. So if you get off the track about is he, isn't he, he's not the answer to our problem. He could have been. He could have certainly helped us along the way. But since he doesn't, don't spend any more time on that subject. Just get on with the revolution. Let's find the leader. Harry Belafonte, Raquel Cepeda, Philip Agnew.
Thank you. And Thank you. Can I take a photo?